Thank you, Laskan Corla. And um, can I say, first of all, that I am very pleased to support this motion to make public transport free and accessible. It's certainly an ambitious motion, but one, I believe, whose time has come. And I listened to the minister there, and he spoke about the fact that, you know, we can't afford it. Um, perhaps it, it doesn't work as well as, as, as they thought it might elsewhere. But the argument of not being able to afford something is, is not a good argument if the objective is a positive one. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But, you know, we're in a crisis at the moment, and sometimes a crisis is seen as an opportunity, a way to do things differently, a way to look at things differently. Mm -hmm. We're not just in one crisis, we're in two. We have the cost of living crisis, and of course, we have the climate change crisis. And if ever you found uh, two situations that came together that would favour many of the proposals uh, that are uh, in this motion, uh, it's certainly there now. So while government policy up to now, while the programme for government might not have been in favour of free uh, universal public transport, I honestly think, Minister, uh, now is the time to consider it. But as I said, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, but as for the motion itself, it's a very ambitious motion. But as I said earlier, surely a motion whose time has come. I note that you are not opposing the motion, which is a recognition in itself that what is contained within this motion, what is asked within this motion, is largely reasonable, doable, and a good policy proposal. And I want to thank uh, my colleague, Thomas Pringle, for giving us a chance to debate and tease out some of his ideas. There's a lot of really good ideas in here. Some perhaps will take longer to put in place um, than others, but I think all of them are, are really good proposals in their own right. And as I said, we have an opportunity this morning to discuss some of them. Now, it is ambitious, but it gets, in my opinion, very many of these policy proposals right. And especially in the context of the cost of living crisis, uh, in the context of needing to cut our CO2 and other emissions, and crucially, um, in the need to ensure that all public transport is accessible. Now, I want to start with that um, point, accessibility. When most people hear the word accessibility, they think about somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who has, let's say, very poor mobility, somebody suffers from sight loss, whatever. They think of a person with a disability. But in truth, access is so much more than this. Access is about universal design. It's not about people with disabilities. Access is for everyone. And sometimes the, there's the idea that there's them and there's us. There's the people who have disabilities and God, we need to do something about it. And then there's us who can get on with our daily lives. But the truth is, for a start, the reality of life is that many of us will become them, if you like, as we age, as our mobility may be compromised. So universal design deals with that issue for all of us from birth to death, as it were. So there shouldn't be any question about this. It should be the way we do our business. So whether it's our buildings or our transport infrastructure. Uh, we must now and for the future ensure universal design. And that's what this motion is asking for in very broad terms. And I think it is absolutely going in the right direction. And I, I know the minister will agree with me because we have signed up to uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, the UNCRPD, and that requires us 
to take the universal design approach. So as I said, whether it's our buildings or our transport infrastructure, this is a whole of population approach and it needs to be embedded in all our designs. Accessibility should be a given. We often speak of independent living and of course that's all of us have independent living um, and it's crucial to the lives of persons with a disability. But it, it, we think in terms of access to buildings or access to services, but it's also about freedom of movement, uh, the kind of movement that for now at least you and I and most people in this chamber take for granted. So this motion is asking us to put that policy at the centre and at the core of where we move from here on public transport. The current situation, for example, whereby sometimes 24 hours notice needs to be given, that has to change. I'm not saying it will be changed by tomorrow, Minister, that takes time. But, you know, the change should be as immediate as possible for all public transport. Private transport perhaps may take a little longer, and I'm not letting them off the hook, I'm not excusing them, but um, everybody has a business to run and they have to look at their costs. But the sooner that it becomes embedded as the way we do things and the way we think about things, then the better. Now, I, I want to briefly look at the issue of rural transport. I think sometimes the, the belief or the sentiment out there is that rural people are wedded to their cars. But in fact, that's not true. It, the practical issue for many people who live in rural areas is that if they don't have a car, they can't move about. But in fact, rural people want public transport just as much as anybody who lives in an urban area. But it, it has to be affordable. And reduction in our use of carbon dioxide is key. And what I would say is that it needs to be frequent, it needs to be accessible, and it needs to be cheap. Now, my colleague, Deputy Pringle, is looking for it to be free. And I support him in this fully. But there are steps along that way that we can take. And I do recognise that government has uh, decreased fares for certain sectors, etc. But I think that decrease needs to be across the board for everybody. Now, but it's not enough for transport to be frequent, to be accessible and to be cheap. It needs to be integrated. Um, and what we're finding is at times that if you look at something like online ticketing, uh, that, that can be a nightmare. Let's say you decide to book the night before. Um, because you get a better price. Uh, you can only activate that 90 minutes before your bus arrives in rural Ireland or I presume elsewhere. You might have no online coverage when you get to the bus stop and you know the, the whole system isn't working well enough as a system for people to be confident that this is the way I'm going to begin to deal with my transport issues uh, from here on in. There's also an issue, uh, Minister, as I said, about it being integrated. Uh, the number of emails that I've got from people who tell me they're, they're coming, let's say, from a small rural parish or village or a rural area into their local town and their bus arrives, maybe there might be a, a service twice a day, whatever, and it brings them to the, their local town. And what do they find? That the main bus services going from their local larger town to elsewhere They've already gone five, ten minutes earlier. So there needs to be that kind of integrated thinking about the provision of rural transport. Finally, Minister, in your response, you mentioned a rail review and improving mm -hmm. train services in the Northwest. I think Deputy Pringle and myself are well aware that that rail review does not include the word Donegal, unless there's a new one that I'm not aware of. So if 
anybody is seriously thinking about um, ensuring that we have a rail service. Am I right, Deputy Pringle, in saying it's one of the few counties in the country, maybe the only one, that doesn't have a train service? Um, maybe one more. Um, there needs to be a, an actual commitment to that. The current rail review won't do it, Minister. And finally, can I say that your uh, free public transport um, I think would be a boost to everybody, especially in the current cost of living oh, crisis. Um, but your proposals around young people are not enough. We need to see this as universal. Thank you.